Hey, I'm Pastor Patrick Lagan. Welcome to Great Life Today. We're grateful for the influence that you lend to us each week. As you like and share our broadcast with your family and friends, I believe the greatest gift you can give to someone is an understanding of how to experience victory in life through faith. Now listen, faith comes by hearing, so let's get into the Word of God for today. Last week we talked about breaking free from uh, breaking free from addictive behavior, and I said I was going to do a part two, but I'm not going to do a part two on addictive behavior. I'm going to talk about living free from addictive behavior, if you will. So it's not going to be the same subject matter. I really do want to make sure that now that you broke free, you know how to live free. And we live free in regards to our faith. Let's go to Romans 1 and 17, because after you're saved, after you give your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, you believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus, confess with your mouth, and you're saved, and your spirit man changes, and now you're alive to God, and you can go boldly before the throne of grace. Well, after that's, that happens, you don't need another lesson on salvation, because you're as saved as you're going to be. However, you do need lessons so you can get faith to live the way that God called you to live. Now, here it says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. For as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so we live by faith. If I'm going to live by faith, I need to have an understanding of faith. And when I say understanding of faith, I don't mean what faith are you, what denomination you are. No, no, no. You need an understanding of faith from the perspective of how do I appropriate and live out the faith that God has given me so I can manifest his problem, promises, excuse me. And so the Bible begins to tell me um, that not only do I live by faith as a believer, and it's important from that aspect, but it's also important if I'm going to select someone who's going to teach me faith. Let's go to Hebrews 6 and 12, because there's a lot of people that go to a lot of places that are not learning faith. But they go for a whole lot of other reasons. They go like because they're entertained. They go because my friend goes there. They go because all these different reasons. But if you don't see the faith in manifestation that someone's teaching, we got a problem. And I'm not saying that they've manifested everything they've talked about that God promised them, but if you're not seeing any type of demonstration and manifestation in their life, if you're not seeing the results of what they're talking about, then that might not necessarily be your pastor or your mentor. It says, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So you should be able to identify the people that God has called you to because they're walking in faith and in patience. That means they're not believing one day something, and then second, God done released me from it, right? And then the other, uh, the other aspect of faith that's important, um, not only is it important because we live that way, not only is it important because uh, I select my mentor that way, but also without it, I cannot please God. Go to Hebrews 11 and 6 because it says, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. For they that come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. It is the will of God that we please God with our lives. And the only way that you can please God, please your Lord, is if you use and walk and appropriate faith. But if no one's teaching you faith, then how can you have it? Because faith comes by hearing. And so, uh, you know, I, I am dedicated to teaching this message of faith, teaching the word of God on a repetitious basis. Ran into somebody, uh, uh, you know, as I was coming back from sitting at the feet of my father in the faith uh, in uh, Atlanta, I came back on Friday night and ran into somebody super late at night. And they were basically, uh, you know, they follow us on, on Facebook, things like that. And they've known our ministry since our inception. Um, I mean, I think 2007, they heard me teaching. And uh, they were just, you know, they, they, you know, gave a lot of compliments. I'm just so glad to run into you because, you know, we f- I follow you and stuff like that. Now, they go to a different church, and they, you know, let them stay at their church. That's good. I'm not trying to talk about that. But at the same time, they say, I'm so, I'm so amazed because you were teaching the word then. You are teaching, and you're still teaching the word. And that's what's most important, that someone teach you the word on a repetitious basis. They teach it when you feel like hearing it. They teach you when you don't feel like hearing it. And here it says uh, in Hebrews that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, but without faith, we cannot please him. So we're always, as believers, should be measuring, am I living by faith? All right. So we please God. Uh, faith is important for pleasing God. Faith is important because I can't choose a, someone to teach me faith without seeing faith in them. Faith is important because I live by faith. But faith is also important. Let's go with me to 1 John 5 and 4. For, uh, faith is important for overcoming problems. Now, this is really why you should make sure your faith is working. See, because it's not hard to embrace faith for prosperity. You know, because really when people first, hear, first start hearing faith, they're like, what can I get? 
Okay, I can get a car with faith. I can get a crib with faith. I can get some cash with faith. I'm cool. But what about problems? When they come, you have to realize your faith is for problems. 1 John 5 and 4 says, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have problems, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And so I've got to understand my faith is for problems. Look at your neighbor and say, your faith is for your problems. Right? And so when I get a problem, I can't be like, why, God, do I got this problem? And God's like, I've given you faith to overcome it. Yeah, and, and your faith is accessed through grace. Remember Paul said, God, why I got this problem? He said, you're, my grace is sufficient. Use your faith, boy. And so that's what we have to understand. But lastly, our faith is important because all the promises of God are received by faith. Let's go to Galatians 3 and 13. Galatians 3 and 13. Um, and, and again, as I talk about living free from addictive behavior, really living free has to, has to do with different mindsets. It says, Christ has redeemed from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. For it is written, curses everyone that hangs on a tree that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So the Holy Spirit is received as believers. We receive the Holy Spirit through faith. So this is a universal principle. If the Holy Spirit, which is a down payment, the earnest of our inheritance as believers, if he is given to us by faith, then all of the promises of God, whatever promise you find in Scripture, healing promises, prosperity promise, promotion promises, all of those are received by faith. But if I don't know how to use my faith, if nobody's going to teach me faith because, you know, I need to feel good when I leave church, what they preach about, I don't know, but the boy, they went in, though. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, because really I'm so grateful that God uh, did what he did at the beginning of the service and stuff like that, you know, because, I mean, it, it, you know, I, I mean, God done did it. I mean, you, you had a God encounter. But here's the thing, that God encounter was necessary for the ground of your heart to be cultivated for you to receive the word so that you can walk in faith with the thing that he told you to do. So in essence, I don't just need worship from the perspective to worship God, but I need, the Bible says, to just live by worship. Now, I, I, I allocate and use worship, uh, faith in my worship, but at the same time, I got to understand faith. So I, this, this, uh, this living free, somebody said living free. Living free from uh, bad, ba bad habits and bad behaviors. How do I do that? Let's go to Proverbs 23 and 7. Uh, really, it's a pretty straightforward lesson. I know it's going to be a benefit and a blessing to you. Um, you know, laid out really simple, easy for you to understand. But in Proverbs 23 and 7, the A clause of that says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Many times this passage is quoted as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. It's the same one, but people just put man in it, all right? But, but the thing is, I can never be anything more more than I think. So if I'm going to be everything that God desires for me to be, I need to learn to think like God. 11 years ago, I was led by the Spirit of God to move across the country from Washington State to Central Florida to found Great Faith Church. God told me that as a result of my obedience, lives would be changed and made better from the teaching of faith. And over the years, Angela and I have watched partners connected to this ministry experience victory in marriage, in family, in career, and finances, just from implementing the simple faith tools that are taught here at Great Faith Church. Now, monthly, we produce a segment called Making Lives Better, where families who have been impacted by this church testify about the power of faith that has changed their lives. Watch this. We were at a point in our marriage where it was just, it, I was exhausted. I was to the point where I just didn't feel like fighting anymore. Our anniversary was coming up and he really pressed it on my heart that we need to take a trip alone without the kids. It doesn't matter the cost, it doesn't matter about the days off. We needed to make it a priority to go away alone. It's about a week away from the cruise. I book it Friday morning and of course I didn't buy the protection plan because I'm thinking what could happen in a week? Literally that night Timothy gets a phone call that his father is in the hospital and he's in pretty bad shape. I'm shocked. You know, I literally just booked this cruise and now we're, we have the added expense, unexpected expense of having to fly up and the added emotional burden, you know, of dealing with something so serious. So he flies up, he ends up coming back on Sunday 
and the following morning, Monday morning, finds out his father passes away. The timing couldn't, from my perspective at the time, couldn't have been worse. Timothy ends up going up for the funeral and he comes back, I, I wanna say Sunday night. Uh, mind you, the cruise leaves Monday. So it was just insanity trying to get ready. Monday came and, you know, I don't know how, but we end up getting to the port in just enough time to miss the boat. I mean, it was still there, I'm still looking at it, but they said, you know, there's no way, they've already pulled the walkway up, there's no way we can get on the boat, there's nobody there except for security. Everybody's on, and they're like, you should've been here an hour ago, and I'm, my mind is blown. I didn't even think we were about to miss the boat. I didn't feel rushed or pressured. I was like, oh, you know, hit 3.30, we'll get there. No idea that we were about to miss this boat. So I'm like, God, we did what you said. I made the, we made the sacrifice. We took the time off. We, even with the death, we're here. We're doing everything you said. I cannot believe that this is happening. At the time I'd been really meditating on like, you know, your words matter because sometimes I don't take, you find yourself not taking seriously what you say. You just feel like you, I need to vent. But I was to the point where I was like, no, this is serious. I cannot vent anymore. I can't play around anymore. My, ma my words matter. So at this point, I'm like, it doesn't matter what it looks like right now. I refuse to accept, refuse to believe that, that, that this is happening. We were making phone calls to Royal Caribbean and they're basically like, there's not much we can do. You didn't buy the protection plan. I go back to the car and I pretty much collapse because I'm like mentally exhausted, trying to stay in faith, but feeling so opposite. My mother-in-law, she drove us there and she's just, you know, talking to, People in Chicago and you know just letting granny know different people different ones who know that we were gone on the trip what happened and while we're driving home you know um, she gets a phone call from a family member who is just like you know I want you guys to still at least be able to do something I want to sell $500 into you so that you can do something for your anniversary and then you know one of the girls in the group chat she's like I want to sell $150 into into a trip for you so already we're like $750. I'm like, that's something. We could do something. And then another another one is like, okay, I've got, you know, points, hotel points that you can use. Another one's like, I got AAA discounts, whatever. Everyone's just throwing something in the bag to make sure that we have the time off. At least we can do something. Stan Thomas reaches out to me and she's like, you know what? Just give them a call. At least just try Royal again. Let them know what happened with the, you know, the sudden death, the sudden passing in the family, and just see if they'll at least give you your money back or a credit or whatever. So, you know, we make the phone call. We call Royal Caribbean, and although we just gotten several no's, I called, Timothy called, we got no's. We get on the phone with someone who's like, if you can provide an obituary, then we will give you back everything that you paid as far as towards a, as a cruise credit towards a future cruise and we will refund you your taxes and your fees like cash so we've already got nearly a thousand dollars that we can use towards a trip right now and we still have our cruise credits that we can use towards a future trip so it's basically two vacations in one which gave me so much hope because i was like i don't even know if i'm going to be married next year so now i'm like okay this marriage thing could work like you know, God wants us to succeed. That was the catalyst and a turning point in our marriage. And from then to now, I, it's like immensely different. But even as we go on and we face challenges, I'm so encouraged by what God did in that moment and how faithful he was and how he just provided that it's, it gives me hope. Wasn't that amazing? God is no respecter of persons. He's given to every man the measure of faith and what he's done in principle for one, he will do for another. I'm in agreement with you that as you release your faith for the challenge that you are currently facing, using the principles that you learn from this ministry, that your life also will be made better. In Acts 16, a story is told of a vision that the Apostle Paul had of a man in Macedonia saying, come and help us. The scripture records that after Paul saw the vision, immediately those that were with him endeavored to go just like God had spoken to them in vision form. Well, just like the Apostle Paul, God told me to come to Central Florida. And since that time, I've trusted the Spirit of God to witness to people just like you that he's called to partner with me to take this message of faith, not only to Central Florida, but to the entire world. 
I look forward to our mutual faith transforming lives in the coming days. And for your Great Life Partner gift today of $10 or more, I'd love to send you out two amazing lessons on how to go from good to great in your life along with this amazing Tumblr. I believe that membership has its privilege and I'm privileged to be a partner with you in faith. Adam was created in such a fashion that God was able to allow him to name every single animal and being in the earth. I mean, his intellect was outstanding, but then man failed. But at the same time, his capacity was still there. But once you're born again, you're raised back to that same level of being able to think like Adam thought. Because God said he created us in his image and in his likeness. And that's in Genesis 1.26. So you have the capacity to think like God. But, but we also have the, the problematic thing of believing it's automatic. Let's go to uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Romans 12. We think it's automatic after we get saved. We're going to think right. But unfortunately, if you were a liar when you got saved, if you don't renew your mind, you're still going to lie. Right? If you had low self-esteem when you got saved, you can go to heaven with low self-esteem if you don't renew your mind. If you think every, oh, I mean, you know, wh whatever your condition as far as your thinking is, salvation changed your spirit man, but not your intellectual capacity or thinking. It didn't change your soulish nature. That happens through the renewing of your mind. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is reasonable service. This is the operative verse. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye therefore transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. And so the Bible tells me as a believer not to allow my thinking to be conformed to the world's thinking. Now, you have the capacity to think well above how the world thinks. But if you're not careful, if all you do is watch the world, listen to the world, run with the world, what you mean? You know, how they think about negative situations. See, your mindset determines how you view and what your perspective is on things. You know, I, I mean, two people can look at the same situation and one believe, oh, my gosh, it's about to turn around. The other one believe I, I'm about to die. So let's give you a definition of mindset and what I mean by that. It's the established set of attitudes held by someone in their thinking. A mindset is an attitude, disposition, or mood. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 10 and 3. Because I've got to understand the Bible tells me not to be conformed to the world's way of thinking. So if I have a natural proclivity to think like the world does in situations when that thinking is challenged by the word of God and what the word says I have to have the willingness to pull down that set of thoughts and values I got to pull that down and replace it with what the God says it says for though we walk in the flesh we don't war after the flesh somebody say I'm at war I'm at war for the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So there are strongholds in your thinking that have to be pulled down, but only you can pull them down. And here's how you do. You cast down imagination. So when you get an imagination that's contrary to what the, world, what the word tells you to imagine and to meditate on. The word tells you to med meditate on things like victory and overcoming and success and pleasing God, right? But your different imaginations come. Imagination's a failure. You know, you get a bill and you, you get a, oh my God, you get behind on your bill, right, uh, on your car payment, and you start envisioning them picking it up and taking it back. You get a vision. And, and it, that is, instead of getting a vision for God supplying all your need according to his riches and glory, he has, he's a God of more than enough, so I know he got a way to funnel this payment to me. But see, but again, based upon your conditioning and your current thought pattern, same thing. You can get married and you think that everybody else's marriage ain't got no problems. But, you know, but that skipped over your wife. That skipped over your husband. They don't know how to treat nobody. And so you run into some difficulty and now you see divorce. You see papers being served. You see plans to be able uh, to uh, divide the children up. You know, you'll be at your house Monday through Thursday, my house Friday through Sunday. You start seeing all of that instead of, wait a minute, that's flesh in my flesh, bone in my bone. I, I call you woe man, and you shall be called good to me. Well, the Bible says a wife is your favor, but you've labeled her a fighter. So guess what? Y'all always fighting. 
But the thing is, I've got to pull down these different imaginations and any high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of of God. The Bible tells uh, wives that husbands, you know, should cover you like Christ. And so you should, you should start calling them. Oh, they, that's, that's, uh, that's my Lord. That's what Sarah did. She called Abraham Lord. And y'all know he was at, wasn't acting lordly. Well, maybe you haven't read the Bible. You know, she said, take my handmaid. And he said, all right. <laughs> well, all right then. And then has a baby from her, and Sarah says, okay, you need to kick that heifer out. I mean, kick that woman out. <laughs> and he like, kick her out? That's my, boy. That's my boy. And God says, she right, kick him out. I'm going to take care of him. But the bottom line is, she still called him Lord. And, and the thing that we've got to understand is there is some thinking that was there before I embraced Jesus as my Savior that needs to be eradicated and uprooted. And, and the Lord ain't going to do it for me. He's going to say, you do it. I've given you grace. When it comes up, flag it and tear it down. All right, all right. Uh, that's a good enough open. Hallelujah. So these, these mindsets, these mindsets uh, of the world, they come, uh, but at the same time, when they come, I got to tear them down. And let me finish this scripture. Uh, the knowledge of God bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So it's a, it's a full-time job chasing thoughts down. And you got you to sign up and embrace this job because this job is the key to your success. Go to 3 John 2. I would that you would prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. Your soul is your mind, will, intellect, emotions, and imagination. And if you have a worldly conformed, soulish way of thinking, soulish way of interpreting things, then you're not going to walk in God's best. So there are some different mindsets that the world has that we're not supposed to have. Number one, we're not supposed to have a worry mindset. 2 Timothy 1 and 7 in the Amplified, it, you know, give me that. It tells us that we're not supposed to be fearful. Beloved, I, the Amplified version, please. Amen. It tells me I'm not supposed to be fearful. He didn't give us a spirit of fear. Beloved, I wish above all things. Here we go. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity. I love this one. Of cowardice, of craving and cringing and fawning and fear. He gave, God gave us a courageous spirit, but he has given us a spirit of power and of love and a calm and well-balanced mind. Look down your row. Declare you're well-balanced all down the row. You're well-balanced in your thinking. You're disciplined in your thinking. You got self-control with your thinking. You're not going to let your mind go anywhere. I'm not going to let my mind go there. Philippians 4 and 6, the Amplified, begins to give us even more insight on how we're not supposed to be worried. It says, do not fret or have any anxiety about anything. So what does that say I'm supposed to worry about? Where's that? There's no room. The will of God for you as a believer is you're not engineered to worry. That's why you don't function well in a worry state. As soon as you're worried, it shuts down your creativity. You can't think on problems. You can't think and use the problem-solving capability, grace, that's on your life in a worry state. You're engineered to solve problems. Not worry about them. I would never leave without giving you an invitation to receive Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. The Bible declares that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so if you're out there and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, you haven't given him your life to lead and to guide you into your destiny, now is the opportunity. Will you say this prayer with me? Say, Father, without Jesus, I know I'm lost. But you said in your word, if I ask you to save me and to come into my life, that you would. Right now, I turn my back on my old way of living, my old way of thinking, my old way of doing things, to accept your salvation and accept you as the Lord and Savior of my life. Holy Spirit, come into my life right now and show me the mysteries of my future. And I know that my life will never be the same. I believe, Jesus, that you came and you died for me and your blood washes away all of my sins. And as a result of this prayer, I believe that I'm being accepted in the family of God. So I declare with my own confession, my own mouth, I am saved. Listen, welcome to the family of God. I declare your life will never be the same.
If you're ever in the Orlando metro area, I would love to have you enjoy one of our Sunday morning God Encounter experiences. Pick one of the scheduled events for your convenience, either 9 a.m. or 11.15 a.m. And we're located at 1458 West 1st Street in lovely Sanford, Florida. Let us know you're coming by visiting greatfaith.church forward slash visit. I know you're going to have an amazing time. This is Pastor Patrick Lagan, and until next time, remember, live abundantly.